Hey guys, Dan here with this week's TV news and reviews. Uh, a lot to talk about this week. We've got uh, the final couple of shows on network television that uh, we haven't covered yet here on the show, which is Nancy Drew on The CW, and ironically, at the exact same time slot, Wednesday night at 9, Almost Family on Fox. So we're going to talk about both of those. We also have a Netflix show called The Politician to talk about, uh, an epics show, which I don't think I've ever seen a show on the epics network, but uh, it's getting a lot of buzz, and that's Forrest Whitaker starring in Godfather of Harlem. We're going to talk about all of that, and we're going to start our review portion in a little bit with a what I what I would consider a television movie. Uh, it's a movie on Netflix, and I've sort of shied away from doing movies on the channel, um, just in favor of more TV stuff because I can be more current with it. Um, but I have done a few Netflix movies uh, along the way, like in the past few months. I did the um, murder mystery movie with Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. I did the Zac Efron one about uh, Ted Bundy. But this seems like kind of a hybrid uh, because it is El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. Obviously following in the footsteps of the Breaking Bad TV series, so it's sort of got the TV edge to it there. And... It's just got the look and the feel, honestly, of a TV show. So um, so we're going to talk about El Camino as well. Uh, that's going to be our first review up in a little bit. But first, uh, some news items to tell you about. We always start with a little bit of news. Um, well, usually, anyway. Uh, and the first thing I want to talk about is that uh, two shows that I've already reviewed on the uh, show here just in the last few weeks have already been canceled. We've seen the first cancellations of the season. Um, well, one has technically been canceled. The other one has just sort of been said, okay, well, we're not going to order any more episodes for the season, and we'll leave it at that. Usually, that means it is not coming back uh, for another season. But um, one of these shows I liked, one of these shows I thought was very average, maybe even disliked, if you want to say that. Um, but interestingly enough, they're both on NBC, and that is Sunnyside uh, with Cal Penn, a comedy on Thursday nights, which I really enjoyed, and then uh, Bluff City Law on Monday nights, which I thought was a bit subpar. So those two are sort of uh, on the outs or already out on NBC. Um, it's interesting because th just the entire landscape of how the the TV ratings affect shows and what constitutes a successful show these days, uh, especially on broadcast television, is such a far cry from back in the day. Numbers keep sliding, sliding, sliding because of things like Netflix, Hulu, but also things like DVRs, and there's just so many different options uh, that it's really hard to get a good breakout show. But uh, these two shows were getting pretty dismal numbers for NBC. Uh, but the whole Sunnyside thing comes with a very interesting twist. Um, so we'll talk about that, I think, second. Bluff City Law is a little more cut and dry. Uh, it was up uh, against another law show on CBS, uh, called All Rise, which I reviewed in the same episode here, and I enjoyed All Rise more, so I can see why that one's the one that's succeeding in the ratings, but um, instead of just canceling it you know, outright, they're giving it the 10 episodes that they ordered and shot. Um, there were, actually, before the season started, NBC ordered six more scripts for Bluff City Law, um, and now has said, okay, well, that we're just not going to produce those scripts, so we're going to stick with the ten that already exist. We will finish out the run um, through, you know, the end of the year, pretty much. Um, you know, probably right before Christmas, it will it will end, and then uh, we'll decide whether or not to bring it back. To me, that means we're not bringing it back, but you know, they kind of want to keep actors under contract just in case maybe they have a terrible you know, fall bunch of fall shows next year, and they're like, okay, well, let's try this again, or, or whatever. Um, you know, it has a good pedigree with Jimmy Smith's, and it's a law show, but didn't really connect with me. Obviously, it didn't connect that well with the audience, so that's sort of where that stands. But Sunnyside is very interesting, because I don't think in the history of television has a show been canceled and yet ordered more... Uh, episodes for in the same news release. You know, shows have been canceled and come back. Um, but so basically the, the deal with Sunnyside is 
their live TV ratings um, were just terrible. Um, and I believe it was the lowest rating for a broadcast network show. Um, not the CW, because that obviously always gets lower ratings, um, just because it's in fewer markets. But, um, you know, the big four, NBC, Fox, uh, ABC, and CBS. This was apparently the lowest rated um, show, I guess, I don't know, ever or something, at least uh, in the, the 18 to 49 demo. I think it got a point four uh, in the 18 to 49 demo. Even after years of like r looking into the ratings and all this stuff, I still get a little confused about like, okay, you know, what does that translate to in millions of viewers or, or whatever? But anyway, it's not good. Um, and of course, the, the very coveted 18 to 49 slot. Uh, is is where they really want people because that's where all you know all the advertising money comes in, at least a lot of it, the the desirable ad money. Um, so what they've decided to do because apparently the ratings on the streaming services Hulu and the NBC app um, have been pretty good for Sunnyside. In fact, apparently it was the most streamed new comedy in two or three years or something on NBC and. You know, NBC is really, uh, I think of all the networks, getting behind the um, the platforms other than live TV. I mean, they're going to have their Peacock app um, coming, I think, in the beginning of next year um, is when that happens, just to sort of give Disney Plus a little, little time to, to ride it out. But, um, you know, CBS has theirs with all access, so they're sort of trying. But CBS has always been hesitant about the streaming stuff because they're the, the network that doesn't play their shows on Hulu, whereas the other networks have been pretty vocal about, hey, you know, it's it's getting people to watch our shows any, any uh, way necessary. So apparently the ratings for Sunnyside on Hulu and, and NBC.com have been great. So they've decided to pull it from the airwaves after the initial four episodes, which means starting this week, uh, they're going to bring back the final season of Will and Grace's reboot uh, a little bit earlier than expected. And so they're going to have the remainder of the Sunnyside episodes online. I don't know whether that's including Hulu or just on the NBC.com or whatever, um, or on the NBC app. Um, but with that cancellation, quote-unquote, they ordered an 11th episode of the show. So not only <laughs> is it still staying in production, even though it was technically canceled, but they're uh, giving it another episode. So this may actually see a second season, um, and it just may be a streaming-only series from here on out. And that's actually what NBC has done with AP Bio. Originally, that was canceled um, at the end of last season. And then a couple months later, I think like in August or something, they were like, you know what? We're actually going to bring this back for a third season, but it's going to be exclusively on the Peacock app. So, um, you know, it's, it's cool. I mean, they're, they're definitely embracing that. I mean... Their whole Thursday lineup, Good Place, other than Will and Grace, which gets good live ratings, but Good Place and Superstore, um, you know, have been big streaming hits for them, and Brooklyn Nine-Nine as well, of course, which they brought over from Fox. Um, so, uh, so even though these shows are both canceled, they may both get a second season in one way or another. It will just, uh, be a matter of time. I would say Sunnyside probably has a better chance of getting a second season because it's at least a hit in streaming. Bluff City Law, you know, probably not so much. Um, but I, I thought that was very interesting that uh, that they went that route with it. Um, and, and cool, too, because I liked the show and I'm, I'm glad that it's not dying, you know. Um, and so speaking of ratings, um, my next sort of news item is about Netflix's ratings for a few recent things, including El Camino, which we're going to talk about later in review form. But Netflix has sort of notoriously shied away from giving, you know, exact ratings or whatever for their um, for their format. And it, it's interesting. Nielsen sort of has a rating system in place for Netflix at this point, but it's TV only. Uh, from my understanding. It's not like if you stream it on your phone, I believe that does not count. Um, so so it's sort of, you know, a little murky, but they've been having success with some of their movies lately, including that Adam Sandler one I mentioned earlier. So they're starting now to sort of be a little more um, 
you know, uh, forthright with their ratings. And the way they count ratings is if, uh, a, if someone in the household watches, they do household ratings, not person ratings, because, you know, which makes total sense because it's kind of impossible to tell how many people are plopped in front of the TV. Um, so they do household ratings, but uh, as long as the household has watched 70% of a movie or 70% of an episode, it counts as a view, which totally, totally makes sense. I mean, that's more than two-thirds, you know, uh, so you can't really argue with that. But uh, they've just released some ratings for a few of their shows and movies, and they're pretty great. I mean, they're, you know, when, when you look at it, 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 certainly TV ratings on broadcast channels, uh, like we just were talking about. So El Camino um, is the big crowning achievement, um, and that hit over, uh, I believe it was... Uh, 30 million views, uh, household views, for the first weekend, which would be, it debuts on Friday, so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, and obviously that's a big hit. And Breaking Bad has been a big hit on Netflix. I think um, it's you know safe to say that having it stream on Netflix is what got people interested in the last couple seasons on AMC and watched it live because they had caught up via Netflix. Um, so that was very encouraging. Stranger Things has over 40 million, the new season. Um, now that goes, TV shows, are, they go a little different because it's like, okay, well, you know, to watch the whole series, there's 10 episodes or 13 episodes, depending on the show. So they do 30-day watches for that. So over 40 million households have watched the third season of Stranger Things, which is a big increase from season two, by the way. And a show that we talked about right here on TV News and Reviews um, that I thought was, was really great, Unbelievable, um, with Tony Collette uh, about the, the girl um, that got raped and people don't believe her and sort of the, the you know, mystery drama um, of that. That had 32 million in the first 30 days. So, um, you know, really cool stuff going on. Also, this movie Tall Girl, which uh, got some press, that got 41 million. Uh, in the first three days, uh, or that may have been for seven days, um, but yeah, either way, uh, these are great ratings for Netflix, and obviously with Disney Plus on the horizon, they want to, you know, put a good vibe out there, put those numbers out there, um, and Stranger Things Season 3, uh, they admitted was, the, it has been their highest rated, uh, series, ever, I guess. Um, the Umbrella Academy was, was the one previously, um, which I still haven't seen, actually, but I hear it's really good. That aired, I guess, in the fall or maybe in the spring? I can't... I think it was the spring, um, maybe in March or something. Um, but that got in the mid-40 millions, so Stranger Things, you know, beat that out um, to become the, the top, you know, season of a series at least in the first 30 days or whatever, on Netflix. So they didn't release any information about the final season of Orange is the New Black, which may indicate that was down a little bit. Um, but, of course, that's... I mean, it's been kind of their flagship show, that and House of Cards. Um, so they just sort of released a statement with these other ratings saying, like, we, you know, really appreciate Orange is the New Black and, you know, all it's done for, for Netflix and this and that. But without releasing specific ratings, I think we can say that probably means it was down a bit. But, you know, it did its job. I mean, it ran for years on the network, um, on the platform, I guess. Netflix isn't really a network, but, um, but I just thought that was cool uh, that they're sort of, you know, sort of getting that news out there of, like, here's how the shows do. Because I'm always fascinated, like, okay, well, they're, you know, they're canceling this, but they're keeping this on, and I don't get it. Like, that seems horrible, and this seemed to have buzz, but now they're getting rid of it. And um, I, I would love to see a real breakdown of ratings uh, for things like Netflix and Amazon Prime and, and Hulu original content. Um, you know, obviously, I don't need to see ratings of who's watching The Office on Netflix, but um, for their original stuff, I would love to see more and more ratings come out with that. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is this week in reboots. Um, so the new reboot announcement this week was Clueless. This is, of course, a movie first, and then it became a show for three seasons on uh, ABC and the UPN. Um, and that was, I mean, the movie was 90, 
94, 95 maybe, and then the TV show came shortly after, um, and Stacy Stacy Dash was in both. So what we know about the reboot is this. Um, it's being shopped to a few networks, but it will likely land at the CW, which is home to all of these other shows that are getting rebooted, like the Walker Texas Ranger thing that we talked about a couple weeks ago. That has landed at the CW, which makes sense because it's Jared Padalecki from Supernatural. Um, but they also, you know, are doing Nancy Drew, which we're going to do a review for shortly. Um, and they have Dynasty. And so, um, you know, the CW is home for a lot of these reboots. So it makes sense that a very youth-oriented movie and subsequent TV show would be rebooted on the CW. Um, so here's what we know about the plot. Um, it will not actually feature the character Cher, which was uh, the Alicia Silverstone character on the movie, but she will be sort of the center of everything. It seems like they're going to do a Riverdale-type thing um, where Cher is missing, and so her buddies are trying to unravel what happened. So I guess it's not going to be quite a comedy, um, which the movie and the, the TV show were. Seems like it's going to be more of a gritty, whodunit mystery. Personally, I'm kind of over that whole thing. Um, I, I, I don't understand. I think if you're going to reboot something... <laughs> I don't know. Like I like I like the way they did the Riverdale show, um, and and I'm still following that. Although I'm a season behind, but um, but I feel like I don't know. Clueless was a comedy, and why not if you're going to reboot it, just make it a comedy again? Um, I I don't understand why everything has to be a, a murder mystery show now, but um, but I guess that's the direction they're going. So it will likely land at the CW. Uh, you know. I'll watch it for for this show, but it, it doesn't seem like something I'm looking forward to. And truth be told, I don't really like the movie that much. I think it's really overrated. Uh, I I kind of was into it when it was first out. Well, I, don't, I didn't see it in theaters, so I guess when it first came to, to DVD or whatever, or VHS, um, is probably more correct. Because um, I, I watched it in college, I remember that. Um, but... It was okay. You know, I liked it. Um, but I watched it again a few years ago, and I just thought, boy, this does not hold up for me. Um, and then I never really watched the TV show. I never got into that. So I don't know if that was any good or not. Um, I'm sure it was probably a typical late 90s sitcom, you know, uh, set in high school and all of that. So I, I can't really... I don't know. Uh... I don't, I don't know what I would expect from this show, but I, from the the theme of, like, making it a murder mystery, I already am kind of not on board, um, but I also am not really that on board with the concept anyway because I don't like Clueless that much to begin with. But um, I think it would have been cooler if it was... Like, I sort of like reboots that do the... Um, the same sort of cast, but from a, a new, you know, like, like adult Paul Rudd and Alicia, not that Paul Rudd probably would do it, but, you know, adult Alicia Silverstone and, you know, have Donald Faison in it and Stacey Dash could come back and, um, you know, I, I don't know. It, I like reboots with the original cast and I'm not saying they always work. I don't think the Murphy Brown one worked very well. Um, but the Will and Grace one and, and Roseanne and, um, the 90201 I thought was really cleverly done. So I, I think it can work, but I, I think it is best with the original cast because the problem is you're always going to be comparing um, the new cast to the original. I have not seen Charmed. Um, that is another one that's on the CW that's that's been rebooted. Um, but from what I understand, like fans of the original Charmed hate the new Charmed. And here again, it's like, the same thing they're they're going to do with this clues. It's like none of the the same actors are on it. You know, I think the point of reboots for the most part is nostalgia. Um, although I don't know, CBS does it pretty well, I guess, with some of their action ones like the Magnum PI and um, MacGyver. They seem to be doing pretty well. and Hawaii Five O, and of course, none of those are the original cast. So I guess it depends on the project, really. But it just seems odd to take a comedy and a pretty like broad comedy and a classic comedy 
Like, Clueless is known as nothing but a comedy. Um, to take it in this, like, mystery drama direction, I don't know. Probably not for me. Um, but let's move into the reviews, and we're going to start out with El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie. Um, so this, you know, premiered on Netflix about a week and a half ago, and um, like I just said, like the ratings were huge for it, you know, big deal. And what's cool about this is it was sort of all shrouded in mystery, like nobody really knew it was happening um, until a trailer was released, and then everybody was like, wait, is this even real, or like... What, what, what are we seeing here? Um, sure enough, of course, it was real, and we went from there. Um, so, you know, Vince Gilligan, the, the, you know, genius creator behind the original Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, um, you know, wanted to do this, this sort of passion project follow-up about the Jesse Pinkman character. I'm not going to give any spoilers. I don't do spoilers, which means I'm also not really going to give spoilers to the you know, last season of Breaking Bad, if you haven't seen that yet, I I don't know. I can't imagine you'd be interested in an El Camino review if you haven't seen Breaking Bad, but whatever, I'm still not going to say anything. But point being, uh, in this movie, we see basically what happens to Jesse Pinkman in the days following the finale of Breaking Bad, which I think many people would agree is one of the great... TV finales. I mean, I, you know, I didn't hear anybody really that was complaining that much about it. Um, you know, Sopranos, it's like, okay, love it or hate it. There was not, not too much in the middle, you know. I think everybody can agree. Like, the Cheers finale was great. Um, everybody can agree How I Met Your Mother finale was terrible. But, like, Breaking Bad, pretty universally loved um, in terms of the finale. So, is this even necessary? Um... No, it's absolutely not necessary. Um, is it interesting? Yes. Um, you know, did I wonder really what happened to the Jesse Pinkman character after the finale? I did not. Um, but apparently people do. And, you know, Aaron Paul has said that people come up to him constantly and ask, like, you know, where do you think Jesse ended up? Or where do you think Jesse is right now? Or whatever. And Vince Gilligan said basically the same, that people were coming up to him all the time with questions about Jesse. Um, so he decided, you know what, let's, let's turn this into something. Um, and the reason I'm sort of doing it on the TV news and review side isn't just because it was you know, from a TV show. Um, because it is a, it's a film. You know, there's there's no question about it. It is a movie. Um, however, the way it is shot and the way it is paced and the way it's uh, written is much less a movie as it is a three-part episode of the show. And, you know, I'm somebody that binged the show. So I didn't watch it straight through. I don't really binge like that. But, I mean, I got through whatever it was, was it six seasons um, in, you know, within about a year and a half. So, you know, I, I paced myself with things, but I didn't watch it in real time. So, so I, you know, so I would watch two or three episodes sometimes at a clip. And basically this movie feels like three episodes put together because it's two hours and two minutes, which once you take out commercials really is about three episodes. Um... You know, it's littered with flashbacks between um, Jesse and a variety of characters that he's come into contact with over the years um, that we've known him. And, uh, again, no spoilers, but I think I think everybody knew who some of the cameos would be going into the movie. As soon as they heard there was going to be a movie, they were like, okay, well, they got to have X, Y, and Z in the movie. So, um, you know, a lot of those characters appear, not all of them, um, but many of, of the characters you would expect do appear. Um, but largely it is, you know, the Jesse Pinkman story. It is Aaron Paul's movie. Um, I think if you like Breaking Bad, I think you'll really enjoy the movie. I think if you love Breaking Bad, you'll probably enjoy the movie even more. Uh, because it really is, I mean, it's 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 more of a thank you to the fans than anything. Um, but, again, the reason I would call this 
more of a TV movie as opposed to a, a, a theatrical movie isn't necessarily because it didn't premiere in theaters. Like that murder mystery movie with Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston, that was a th theatrical type of movie that they just happened to premiere on Netflix. And same thing with, you know, a lot of the ones I've seen there. But this is shot the same way the TV show was shot. Um, you know, it is it is paced in the exact same way. Um, I think if this were a theatrically released movie, people would see it. There's no doubt in my mind. People would go see it, and they would have paid money to see it, even though they got their Breaking Bad episodes for free for years. I know people would pay to see this, but... Um, but I think they would be a little more disappointed if it was in a theater and they paid $12 to see it rather than watching it at home for free like the rest of the Breaking Bad series. Um, that's just my two cents on it. Um, one thing it did make me think about was how our action movies these days are paced. Because this, because it is written more like a television show... Um, which makes sense, because that's what Vince Gilligan knows. That's what he does. Um, there is a lot of, uh, you know, downtime between action sequences. There's a lot of quiet moments. There's a lot of um, character development. There's a, you know, and, I mean, I think we've developed the Pinkman character a lot over the years, so I don't necessarily mean with his character, although there is some of that. Um, but it's, you know, some of the people around him, too. But... More, it's some of the characters in the flashbacks, um, which I thought was interesting. I thought that was an interesting sort of hook or whatever um, to delve a little bit more into situations maybe we already knew, but not the intricacies of, if that makes sense. Um, so, overall, I, I enjoyed this movie, um, but I think... I think it's fair to call it a television movie, um, and that's why I'm grading it as such. But um, but our action movies these days, at least the big hits, are you know like Fast and Furious and John Wick and Transformers, and some of those movies are good. Some of them are not good, but some of them are good. Um, but it's mostly wall to wall action. There's very and it's loud action. You know, there's not a lot of like. You know, like, in this movie, there's literally, like, a a Wild West-type standoff, you know? And it's compelling to watch. It's interesting. Um, and I feel like that's something that gets a little neglected these days at the multiplex. Um, so I was, I was happy to see that. Um, but it made me think about that. It made me think, you know, we really are doing, like, these action movies, just, like, nonstop action, not a lot of plot... And, you know, it makes sense when you get up to the eighth or ninth movie in a franchise, Fast and Furious, hello. Um, you know, we just, okay, fine, you just make the action bigger and better. Well, here, we didn't need to do that because, you know, I don't think of Breaking Bad necessarily as an action show. It's a drama. It had some action sequences, no doubt. But it, it was a drama and is a drama. So, um, so you know, Gilligan made that conscious decision to basically, you know, I mean, I don't know how he thought of it, but that's totally how it comes across. I think Aaron Paul's great in this movie. Um, you know, my only complaint with it would be, I mean, I have several, I guess, but the main complaints would be um, that it is basically just an extension to the TV show and one that we didn't need. I, I didn't really need to know that this stuff happened. I didn't need to know the, the fate of Pinkman's character. Um, but it was interesting. I enjoyed it very much. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure that I'll ever watch it again, but I suppose I would if I went through the series again, um, which I might do once Better Call Saul finally ends, because at some point, you know, since that's a prequel, at some point Better Call Saul has to kind of catch up with the events of, of Breaking Bad. Um, so... I guess maybe once that's over, I would go through the whole series again. Um, but I, I found it enjoyable. I thought the like Jesse Plemons is great in it. That's a little bit of a spoiler because that is a sort of cameo. But um, but I think he gives a great performance. Um, and I don't 
think this is a spoiler because I think it was sort of all over the place when this gentleman died, but Robert Forrester, um, who just died a couple weeks ago, in fact died on the day this movie premiered, uh, this is now his last film, um, and I think that's really cool because he does a great job in it as well. Um, but did it need to be, as long as it did, or as long as it is, no, you know, did it need to exist at all? No. Um, but I, I don't hate that it does. I mean, I, I really did enjoy it. So um, I, I'm going to leave El Camino, a Breaking Bad movie, with a B plus. I think um, it's, it's a worthy addition to the canon, uh, if not necessary. So up next is Nancy Drew over on The CW. And this is uh, one of only two new fall shows from The CW. We had uh, the Ruby Rose-led Batwoman last last episode I talked about that which I did not care for um, and this is basically more of the same uh, in the CW vein that I was talking about just a moment ago with the whole clueless thing um, because it's basically you know I mean Nancy Drew is you know the mystery lady anyway but so here it's like you know murder mystery and drama and oh you're on the CW so it's got to be dark and um and the lady that's playing her is Kennedy McMahon which I don't know from anything um you know as far as I know that's this is her first thing but um she's a little older in this than we've seen some of the other iterations of Dancy Drew I mean we've seen a lot of different ones in the past most recently I guess um well I think there might have been a recent movie but I mean not a successful one, but the most recent successful Nancy Drew thing was the movie with Emma Roberts, which was like, I don't know, 10 plus years ago at this point, maybe 12 years ago. Um, in fact, I think I might have it on my shelf. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, you know what? I don't. Okay. I thought maybe I did. You, you know, Wait, do I? Yes, I do. All right. Hold on. Here you go. Emma Roberts and Nancy Drew. So what year was this out? Probably 2006, maybe, does it say? Um, 2007, okay, so I was right, so about 12 years ago. Um, and, you know, obviously she was playing the high school Nancy Drew. This this one's a little bit older, a little bit more mature, um, you know, and then the main plot of this, and I guess that we'll go through the whole season, sort of like Riverdale did, is this, you know, mystery within her family and trying to figure that out. Um, and Scott Wolf from Party of Five is in it as uh, her, her dad, and he's like a defense attorney, and so he's sort of got his own ideas about what, you know, this, this case is or whatever. Um... Here's kind of what I wanted to see from Nancy Drew. I wanted to see a classic story of Nancy Drew, which is I solve mysteries, you know, and she can be a little older, she can be hip, she can be whatever, um, but this show fails us because it's just another supernatural show. Like, if she's going to solve mysteries, why do they have to be supernatural just because it's on the CW? Um... Okay, fine. Supernatural, the show is ending. All right. But, like, Riverdale already delves into, like, way more supernatural stuff as it probably needs to as the seasons are going on. I, like I said, I'm a season behind, and it's already getting, like, kind of too weird. Um, and I'm still sticking with it because I love Archie, but um, I just feel like I know the CW has their, their brand, and their brand is everything's got to be supernatural. Um, or superhero, I guess, is the two. Supernatural, superhero. Um, but I think the, the show ends up with a, a disservice because of that. I think, you know, if you're going to do a Nancy Drew, just do it as Nancy Drew. Like, you don't have to make everything supernatural. Because it's basically the same show as Riverdale, except with Nancy Drew instead of Archie. Um, you know, or, or Sabrina, the, you know, Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, which I know isn't CW, it's on Netflix, but same concept and same property since it's owned by Archie. So, uh, you know, I think the girl that plays Nancy Drew's fine. Um, I, I prefer the Emma Roberts version. 
um, from the movie. But I mean, look, the movie was cutesy, you know, the movie was, if I'm not mistaken, rated PG. Um, so, and why wouldn't it be? It's Nancy frickin' Drew. Yeah, okay. Um, even the quote, a delightful adventure for the whole family, um, says NBC TV. So, you know, that was, that was then, this is now, every, it's 2019, everything's gotta be dark, everything's gotta be supernatural, everything's gotta be, you know, crazy. Does it, though, you know, like... <laughs> No, it doesn't, because it makes it boring. It makes it, it makes everything boring. Um, I was bored with this show, and I sort of, like, I started, like, eye-rolling when all the supernatural stuff started happening, because I'm just like, okay, can we, can we not with this? Um, so, I, you know, I thought she did an okay job. Like, the acting's okay, um, but it just, because of its tone, because of its, um, the, the themes and everything. It just, it looks like every other show on the CW. At least Batwoman is set apart because, I don't know, it's a female superhero, which is a little different from Arrow and, you know, all the all the DC shows on there. I mean, I guess Supergirl. Okay. True. You've already, so you've already got her, but oh, the, but, okay, Batwoman's a lesbian. Okay, fine. Whatever. But the point is, I don't know, and it's not, I don't know, it's not even that I'm, like, not in the demo for the CW, because I'm not in the demo for a lot of things I watch. I, I watch a lot of shows on Freeform, which is, I would say, geared towards high school girls, right? Uh, you know, like, I was a big fan of the Fosters, I watched the Bold Type, I watched Grownish. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't think it's necessarily that, I just think at least those three shows I mentioned on Freeform are all completely different from each other. My problem with the CW shows is they're they're just all the same, you know. Either it's supernatural or superhero. So, um, so I can't give this a good grade, you know. But I do. I think she does a good job as Nancy Drew. The acting, you know, from everybody is okay. Um, and and I can't even say that the mystery was, you know, boring or. Um, I mean, I'm not really intrigued enough to stick with the show. I don't really care enough about the, 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 the family to continue. Um, but for a pilot, it got the job done. It introduced us to all the characters properly and, and all of that. But it just, it doesn't stand out at all to me from anything else on the network. So, um, so I leave Nancy Drew 2019 with a C minus. Um, so a little actually lower than, uh, the Batwoman, which was also not good. Um, so up next is, interestingly enough, uh, right up against Nancy Drew over on Fox Wednesday nights at nine, uh, and that's Almost Family. And these are the last two network shows of the fall that we have to talk about. I'm sure as more things get canceled, we'll be talking about, you know, other shows, but for the next few weeks, it seems like it's going to be a lot of, like, cable shows or... Um, and Netflix shows, which is actually nice because we've got Apple Plus premiering in about a week and a half, and then we've got Disney Plus in less than a month, so I'll be definitely doing a lot of those shows. But um, but this is called Almost Family. This is um, on uh, Fox TV. It stars Brittany Snow, and this is there's three uh, Pitch Perfect ladies that have new shows this fall. You've got um, Perfect Harmony, with Anna Camp over on NBC, and then you've got Batwoman with um, Ruby Rose. So here we have uh, the uh, the head, I guess, of the Barden Bellas, I think. Um, it's been a while since I've seen Pitch Perfect, but I, I think she was the head of the Barden Bellas. It's Brittany Snow, and, um, or maybe Anna Camp was the head. Anyway, um, I digress. None of these shows that the Pitch Perfect ladies are in are good. And this actually is the worst of them, I would say. The premise is basically, um, Anna, uh, Brittany Snow plays, what's the name of the, the lady? Uh, Julia Beckley. Um, and she is basically the PR director for her father's, uh, fertility clinic. He's played by Timothy Hutton. Um, and it's found out in the pilot here that, um, he has, actually been putting his own sperm into a lot of these, uh, you know, fertility cases. And so he's got like a hundred some kids out there. And so basically she's got to deal with that as his daughter, but also as his 
PR campaign person, so she's sort of trying to spin this, and meanwhile, she's, like, going kind of crazy, like, oh my god, you know, my dad's kind of a monster, and this, that, and the other thing. So, um, also, uh, in, in the cast is Emily Osment, who I like, you know, enough, she's pretty cute, um, she does some good stuff, and Timothy Hutton, like I mentioned, he, he does, uh, you know, a pretty good job as the, the dad slash, you know, prick doctor. He does a good job with that. Um, so, you know, I, I can't say that the cast here is, it's failing. I think the cast is giving it their all. I think they're, they're doing what the director most likely wanted them to do. Um, but here's my problem. First of all, just the whole theme of this show is just yucky and like unappealing and um not just not good like it's just not what i want to settle in for um but i would say the biggest issue is the tone of this show is all over the place um wikipedia lists it as a drama i would say it's probably more of a dramedy because they're clearly trying to do some comedy stuff with it and because it's on Fox, it's that sort of, um, like, cheeky kind of comedy, like, that, that Lethal Weapon had, where it's like, you know, look at this guy, he's, he's a mess, he's an a-hole, but isn't he kind of funny, too, a little bit, like, isn't he kind of cute and funny, uh, you know, it works for some shows, it doesn't work for others, Lethal Weapon, that's sort of the premise, and it was the premise of the movie, so it worked for me, um, here, it just, it comes off as, just not good like it comes off as gross and annoying and um sm too smug um so they're they're to me sort of going for this uh this is us vibe because it's like oh hey like you know emily osmond is this like olympic skater that has fallen from great or gymnast or something that has fallen from grace and, um, you know, is, is making most of her money from, like, appearances and, and autographs now. So she's like, oh, I always wanted a, a, a sister, I always wanted a family, you know, here I am. Um, you know, and then this, this black couple, same thing, they're going through this marital problems, but, oh, wait a second, you know, maybe you're one of our siblings too. And it's like, it, even even in that point, because it's like, this is us as, you know, two two white siblings and a black sibling and okay you know here we go almost family so it's like even at that angle they're trying for that it just it seemed to smack of that and as the season goes on you know i don't know we may find out many more siblings you know i could see they've sort of opened up the endless possibility scenario with that um so it's like the the tone is just so off on this show um, the comedy doesn't work at all, and should it even be a comedy? Uh, I don't know. But the drama doesn't work either because I don't care about any of these people. Not, no, I don't think any of the characters are really good people. Um, and that tends to be an issue. And not always. I mean, you know, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. They're not, none of those are, you know, people are good. Seinfeld, none of those people are good. But it's it's a tonal thing, you know. You can you can do it with certain shows and then not with others. And with this type of a show, it's like they're going for this sort of. And it's also like Desperate Housewivesy, maybe a little bit. Like I I, I just I, I it left me with a a not great taste in my mouth. I would say it's the worst show of the season. Um, I'm giving it the same grade as I gave Bob Hart's Abishola, but I think that one at least had its heart in the right place. Um, it just wasn't funny or, you know, it didn't all, that didn't all really jive with me either. But I think there's more potential for that show than for this one. Um, but because the cast is, is really giving their all and, and they're, you know, at least trying, it seems like. Um, I'm going to leave Almost Family with a D+. Plus. Again, the same grade I gave Bob Hart's Abishola, but this is certainly the worst of the two shows. Um, so, take that for, for what it's worth. 
Um, so up next we have The Politician, and this is on Netflix. Um, now, for the other streaming things I've reviewed thus far, which is like, you know, a couple of things on Netflix and Amazon and those first couple episodes of TV news and reviews before all the broadcast shows started coming out, um, I was I had enough time to binge the whole series. Like, unbelievable, I binged all, I think it was, is there eight episodes of that? Um, you know, Undone, I binged all that. Um, but here I decided to just do what I've been doing with the network shows and just watch the first episode. And this show is sort of weird timing-wise because some of the, like this pilot episode was a little over an hour, um, and then a lot of the episodes are in that like 50 to 60 minute vein, and then there's like one episode in the middle of the season that's like 28 minutes or something, or 34 minutes. It's like way under. So I don't, I don't know. I think, I think that's a little bit weird about Netflix. I. I feel like, I don't know, I guess there is something to be said for, you know, use the time that you need to tell the story, so some episodes are going to be longer than others, but I don't think a disparity of a half hour difference is good, right? It tells me that either that episode just didn't have enough to say, or the season could have been one episode shorter and they could have crammed, you know, a little more, or a little less in somewhere. Um hard to say really but um but anyway so this grade is just for the first episode of the politician but um essentially the uh the storyline is that there's this kid um who you know has dreams of going to ivy league school uh i believe it's harvard and he really wants to be class president of his senior year in high school he's going against um a sort of frenemy of his but that he also kind of has a little thing going with physically um and uh he is you know sort of this rich kid from originally the wrong side of the tracks but then he got adopted by gwyneth paltrow and um you know so she is of course playing like the you know the rich you know i, I don't know heiress but rich woman who has adopted him and given him everything he needs and um all of this so He's living this rich life, but he had humble beginnings um, when he was born. So that's sort of the, the basic concept. In the very first episode in the pilot, um, the, the friend actually ends up killing himself, um, which, you know, makes uh, this character... What's, what's the character's name here? Um... Uh, Peyton Hobart. It's even it's even a snooty name, right? Peyton Hobart. Um, so he's played by Ben Platt, who um, I've seen in, again, Pitch Perfect. Here we go. So I guess this is the fourth Pitch Perfect alum to get their own show this fall, um, although he was only in the first one. Um, but uh, I've seen him in, in a few other things, but uh, you know, Broadway people and musical fans will know him from Dear Evan Hansen, which I unfortunately have not seen, but I hear it's phenomenal. Um, so, but I, I know him from that, and, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, of course, is in this. We know her from being Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, and Zoe Deutsch is in this as well as a, uh, cancer, uh, patient who Peyton wants to get for his running mate to make him seem more human to the rest of the, the kids. Um, but the main, I would say, like, hook with this show is that it is a Ryan Murphy show. And I have not seen all of the Ryan Murphy stuff. Um, I don't watch American Horror Story. I've always sort of thought it would creep me out, so I never watched it. Um, but I was a big fan of Glee when that first started, and um, I even watched Nip Tuck a little bit when that first started. Again, it got a little too, like the the plastic surgery stuff got a little too gross for me, so I kind of bailed on Nip Tuck. Um, but I've seen, um, I've seen the, the OJ thing, the American Crime Story thing that he did. Um, I haven't seen Pose yet, but I hear, obviously, that's excellent, and that Billy Porter's great on that. So, um, so this show, and he, here you go, here's an example of pretty much all unlikable characters. I, there's nobody really in this show to necessarily root for. Um, unlike in Glee, where you could, you know, well, all the kids are little underdogs, so you root for them. Um, but here, nobody's really likable. But I think some of them have reasons for being so. Um, you know, like, I don't know, like, Gwyneth Paltrow's the, the rich woman, so it's like, does she know any better? Like, she's just sort of 
out of touch, you know? Um, I don't necessarily think she's a bad person, this character. Um, but certainly the, the core is, you know, probably pretty bad. You know, Peyton and his friends and these other guys. And um, and even this this girl played by Zoe Deutsch's character, um, the, the cancer patient, may not actually have cancer. We find out sort of towards the end of the pilot from one of Peyton's friends, like, she might be faking it. Um, so, but we don't, I don't know that yet. Um, you know, I don't know how that's going to shake out, but that just is sort of at the very end of the pilot. Um, I think if you sort of get behind the whole Ryan Murphy, tongue-in-cheek, comedy drama, sort of over-the-top, soap opera-y type thing, this will be for you. Um, I sort of do get behind that. I think Ryan Murphy is uh, very good at what he does. Uh, again, I haven't seen everything that he does, but I think he, he, he focuses on these characters that are not necessarily um, likable, but you can still get behind them. Um, like Feud, the, the um, Joan Crawford and Betty Davis show. I, I did watch that as well. That was Ryan Murphy. And it was like... You sort of see why these characters do what they're doing. Um, and, yeah, maybe it's for their own personal gain in some way, but also you sort of, you know, like he really wants to get into Harvard, so it's like, okay, well, I'm going to screw everybody over on my way. But then, you know, in the first episode, his sort of boyfriend or whatever kills himself, which is horrible, but then it's like, oh, but he's also my opponent. So maybe that's a good thing. So it's like, they, they've got, th these characters have different layers that I don't think anyone in, in the Almost Family show has. Um, so I think that's kind of the difference sometimes with, you know, unlikable characters. Um, but I think Ryan Murphy has done another good job here. I don't think it's amazing. I don't I don't think it's reinventing the wheel, but it's, it's soapy fun. Uh, and I think I will definitely continue with it. Um, as, as the weeks go by. Again, I'm not much of a binger, so I don't think I'll watch the remaining... I think there's ten episodes. I don't think I'm going to watch the remaining nine episodes right in a row. Um, but I definitely am, am curious to see where these characters go. I'm interested to follow them. Um, and I, I enjoyed this show. I think uh, Netflix has has a, a nice little hit on their hands there. Hopefully they give it a second season. Um, it's always hard to tell. They usually will, will say within about six to eight weeks, um, of a show premiering if it gets a second season or not. Um, I haven't heard anybody talking about this show, which is kind of weird because it's Ryan Murphy and Gwyneth Paltrow's in it. Um, I would have figured maybe I would have heard more, but I just saw that it came up as a premiere, uh, in the last week of September. I thought, that sounds interesting. What's it about? And I saw Ryan Murphy. I was like, okay, I think I'm in. Um, so yes, I think if you like the Ryan Murphy stuff, you'll enjoy this. I'm giving The Politician a B, and again, that's just for the pilot episode, not for the whole season like I did with uh, the other Netflix shows earlier in my reviews. Um, so we close with uh, The Godfather of Harlem. This is on Epix, uh, which again, I don't think I've ever watched anything on Epix. I don't get the Epix channel, so I had to, uh, to watch this a little bit after the fact. I premiered like three or four weeks ago. I think they've they've aired a few episodes so far of this. Um, but this is an hour-long um, gangster show, basically, gangster drama. Um, and it's actually sort of a prequel to um, American Gangster, the Denzel movie, I guess, um, because it's, it's sort of set in that same world. It's set in the same time period, which is like late 60s, Vietnam War style. Um, and... It stars uh, Forrest Whitaker, Vincent D'Onofrio, um, Paul Sorvino's in it. Speaking of Breaking Bad, Giancarlo Esposito's in it, who plays uh, Gus Fring in Breaking Bad. Um, so it, it's got you know a, a pr pretty nice uh, cast of good dramatic actors, which is something that a show like this needs because um, you know it, it can it can fall pretty easily if there's not a good cast to back it up. Um, now, this is not my type of show. I'm going to say that right off the bat. I don't necessarily 
Love the gangster stuff. Um, my buddy Merlin has introduced me to some of it. You know, I had never seen The Sopranos before a few years ago. I ended up loving it. Um, but I, I still have not seen some of the classics. I've seen Goodfellas. I have seen that, but I've never seen the Godfather movies. Um, and I did watch American Gangster when we were doing the um, Oscar A to Z list uh, when we were doing Film Fanatics. But um, in this, you know, based on a true story kind of thing, um, Whitaker plays Bumpy Johnson, uh, the, the famous gangster, right after he, or, you know, crime boss, whatever you want to call him. Um, this is right after he gets out of prison. So it takes place, you know, sort of in that time period. And it's basically like when he was in prison for 10 years, his old neighborhood was basically taken over by um, the Italian mafia. So now it's like, you know, Italian mafia versus black mafia kind of thing. Um, and Malcolm X features prominently in this show. And who plays him? Because uh, it was somebody that I thought did a great job. Nigel Thatch, who I don't know, but um, but boy, he, he played a great Malcolm X. Um, so, you know, I, 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 I hope he will factor in to some of the remaining episodes, if not all of them, because uh, I thought he did a great job. So um, I think this show is very well done. I think any any fan of this type of show, the gangster, you know, uh, the you know the mob show uh, drama, will find something to like here. Um, if not the performances, maybe the uh, the plots or the settings. I mean, the, the scenery is fantastic, um, you know. And again, I, I I feel like I say this a lot. Um, you know, are they reinventing the wheel? No, um, you know, but the performances here are great. I mean, Forrest Whitaker especially, and uh, the gentleman I just said, you know, Thatch that plays uh, Malcolm X, both of them are great. Um, and actually, Vincent D'Onofrio is really good, too. And, you know, he's he's come a long way from his Law & Order days. Um, he, he shows up every so often. He can do a few different things. I mean, I've seen him in comedies, and I've seen him, you know, in, in more dramatic things. Um, and here it's certainly, you know, a, a drama sort of slash action, I guess, a little bit. But it's definitely more drama than action. There's not a ton of, like, you know, you know, gun scenes. There's some, um, as, as you'll get. But it's, it's very much um, paced in the same way and style that The Sopranos was, which is, you know, characters first, and then let's, let's talk about the action. Um, you know, so I liked that about it as well. But, yeah, here it's, it's mostly all about the characters and the um, the the setting and the the plot, the whole um, you know gang war thing is very interesting. Um, and I don't listen. I don't know a lot about this this time period in history. Um, and I don't know. American Gangster was an okay movie, but I don't really remember most of it because I, I thought it was kind of boring to be honest. Um, and you know, look, Denzel did a great job, but. It was. It wasn't very much about the gangster. It was more about the cop chasing him. I felt like so. Um, so that fell a little flat for me. But but here it's you know it's all about Bumpy and Malcolm X and and his, his the whole crew really um, and and what they want to do to take their you know their turf back uh, after ten years of of Bumpy being incarcerated. So um, you know great performances here. Again, it's not my kind of show. I don't know if I will continue watching it. It's one of those where it's like, I can see the talent involved. I can see that it is good for what it is. Um, you know, but am I, I don't know how many episodes there are um, in total. Sometimes you, you, you can't really tell because they haven't all aired yet. Like, okay, well this is listing eight, maybe. Um, and they go every week, so um, it goes up till November 17th. So, okay, so if eight, eight episodes... I might stick with it. I might not. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, depending on what else comes out for the season and what gets canceled and whatever. Um, but I really enjoyed this, actually. It held my interest very well. Um, and a lot of good performances. Again, is it the most original thing? No. It's certainly been done better in The Sopranos and other things. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I guess I keep mentioning The Sopranos because as far as TV shows... I can't think of too many gangster shows that I've watched. Movies, yeah. I've seen a handful of, of mob movies, you know, Black Mass and um, uh, Public Enemies and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, obviously I mentioned Goodfellas already. But 
Um, yeah, TV shows, I don't know. Sopranos might be the only one I've ever seen. I mean, The Untouchables, um, but I have not... I don't think I've ever seen that show. I've seen the movie. I saw The Untouchables movie, but... Um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I guess that's... I mean, and, and The Sopranos is like the, the, the pinnacle anyway. Like, even if there were a hundred mob shows, I feel like Sopranos would still be up there, you know, in, in the higher echelon for sure. So it doesn't it certainly doesn't hit that height. But uh, but I thought it was very good. I think it's it's a great start to this series. Um, Whitaker is, of course, a great actor. I mean, I, you know, I didn't even need to go into detail on that because that's sort of a given. Um, but he does his usual great job here, of course. Um, but so I leave The Godfather of Harlem with a B+. Uh, so that is going to do it for the uh, news and reviews for this week. Um, I'm not sure what will be coming up now that all the network shows have started. Um, so it looks like I'll be, you know, looking to Netflix and Hulu and, and Amazon for more ideas. I know there's a Paul Rudd show that just started airing on Netflix, um, or just went up on Netflix, I should say. Started airing makes it seem like there's there are going to be multiple episodes every week, and there's not. Um, also, I wanted to check out this uh, Why Women Kill on CBS All Access, which was just renewed for a second season. Lucy Liu stars in it, who I love. So I might check that out as well. Um, but yeah, I don't know. You never really know what you're going to get with the, with the TV news and reviews. Um, but you can bet that I will be doing Disney Plus stuff, maybe Apple Plus stuff. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to plunk down the $5 a month for Apple Plus. I probably will. I mean, it's, you know, 5 bucks a month is pretty cheap. Because um, I would like to check out the Shyamalan show and a couple other things they have going on. Um, although the Shyamalan show does not go up right on November 1st when all the other stuff premieres. So, I don't know. Maybe I'll wait a little bit. But... Um, but anyway, that's, that's the show. Um, there was no Connors episode this week, so I don't have a Connors, uh, review that will be going up this week, but I have a Fraser Friday coming. I have another Disney review coming with, um, Merlin. I think we're going to do a Dumbo, um, and a bunch of great stuff like that. So, uh, check that out. Join me next week for uh, another episode of TV News and Reviews. And until then, bye.